Good morning. Good to see everybody here today. Uh, Psalm 95, verse 2, let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Amen. It's good to see everybody uh, here today. We are going to be continuing our journey uh, through our uh, series on the Holy Spirit. And what we're going to be doing today is looking at a uh, uh, the, the title, basically, Our Comforter who can be blasphemed, uh, our, our, our comforter, who can be hurt. This is the eighth lesson in our series on the Holy Spirit, and, and what we're doing today is combining actually to what a lot of times we look at uh, as separate studies. You know, we'll look at him being the comforter, we'll look at him being the, you know, the... Uh, uh, someone who can be blasphemed, but what I want to do today is actually combine the two. And the reason for that is, if we're in one study and then we miss the other study, that might cause a person to get an imbalance, right? And so I want us to have a an even perspective between both the positive uh, and the negative here. If one's attention is too far to the right, it may lead to an attitude toward God's Spirit that may tend to be less respectful if leaning too far to the left, an attitude of paralyzing fear, you know, might be the result. So I want us to maintain, you know, a, a good balance. So we're going to look at both of these uh, perspectives today. To begin with, we're going to talk about the comforter. And there's there are four... Uh, four different aspects th that we can see about the Holy Spirit being our comforter. And some of these are going to be somewhat uh, redundant from other lessons that we've already covered in the series, but I think they're good here to look at them because each of the passages that we look at have the word comforter uh, in them, of course, depending upon the version that you use. But uh, from John chapter 14, verses 6... Uh, Verses 16 and 26, it says here, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper uh, or comforter that he may be with you forever. And then verse 26, but the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Now, if you remember from past studies that we've had here, these are really references specific to the... Uh, the disciples of Christ, because there was a time when Jesus was not going to be with them anymore. And uh, he is saying here that the divine presence of God, the Holy Spirit himself, was going to be able to remind them of things that they needed to share, to write down. From Peter's writing, it's a passage that we have used before. It is uh, uh, it, it is good for us to be mindful of it from first Peter chapter or second Peter chapter one verses 20 and 21. Know this first of all that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So that's really what these passages are talking about. But it still begs the question, does the Holy Spirit remind us today? You've heard me say in, 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 uh, in past lessons, I would come up here to preach and, uh, just, and I would, and I would readily admit the Spirit laid something on my heart. He reminded me of a passage that was so relevant to the need of the moment that I would share that with you. Okay. I, I do believe that the Holy Spirit can remind us today, but there it, it's not in uh, it's not a miraculous it's not in a miraculous manner, as Jesus said would take place with his disciples, as we read in John chapter fourteen verses sixteen and twenty six. It comes to us through another method, and and that is a method of Recall. We study our scripture. We read our Bible. We are, we are told that there is a benefit 
to memorizing Scripture. Why is there a benefit to memorizing Scripture? Well, if Peter says that we need to be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks of us, we cannot be as ready as we could be or should be in those situations if we haven't put some kind of passage within our memory. Now, I'm going to admit, we can meet with somebody in a hundred different conversations. Am I going to remember or recall a specific passage uh, most useful for that particular situation each and every time? No, but it doesn't mean what passage I have in mind isn't going to benefit them at all, because it will. Romans 10, 17, what does that tell us? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I can benefit from it. Certainly someone else will benefit. Is it the right passage that they specifically need at that particular moment? Maybe not. But that's not up for you and I to judge anyway. We put God's word in their mind and what it can do, what it has the very possibility of doing is causing them to look even more through God's Word on their own for those particular things that they need that would benefit them, right? Aging is something that's unavoidable, all right? It's going to happen. I was uh, out watering the plant out front. Sabrina came out there and helped me, and 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 because uh, the wind likes to knock it over, you know, maybe we need to... Uh, uh, mount that a little bit, that flower pot a little bit better. But anyway, she went out there. And, and so we were talking about her recent birthday. How old are you? She says, four. And I said, wow, that is awesome. Before you know it, you're going to be five. You know. And so we had that, that little bit of a conversation uh, there. But aging is unavoidable. The very nature of aging can cause us to lose our ability to recall things. Um, but it doesn't mean we can't stave that off a little bit. Harvard Health, and I have a reference here if you want to read the whole article there, but Harvard Health states that another contributor to poor recall is a simple lack of memory practice. God tells us how to practice our memory. If you're reading through scripture and you think, oh man, that is pretty awesome. Uh, I, I would like to memorize that. Do it. Write it down. I used to, when I was in school, I had a carabiner uh, that, that I would clip and I would write my memory verses on round colored paper and I would laminate them and I'd punch a hole in them. And I would, it was just like a flip chart. You know, on one side I had the verse, on the other one I had the passage written out, you know, and that, that helped me with my studies then. I don't do that particular thing anymore, but it doesn't mean that I don't write them down. You have that mechanical thing going on. You are tying your brain to that, that process of writing that word, those words, that phrase, those phrases, those verses. You're writing them down and it helps you to recall them. So anyway, memory practice. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 15. Uh, it, it, it goes a bit further in this particular, uh, method for helping us to recall, okay, for the Holy Spirit to remind us. The passage there, it says to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, handling accurately or right, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent, yes, the word of truth. So there, there are... Uh, uh, a couple of things to point out here. The word study, if I ask you, you know, to give me your idea of study, I, I will get kind of some different kinds of responses, but they'll all be similar, uh, uh, 
at least from those perspectives, because whether you're a career person and, and you are working on a project, you have to study uh, for that. Um, I fell on the radio that I listened to uh, over the holiday weekend. He said, I am locking myself in my room and I am going to write a book. And uh, he was asked the question, well, how are you preparing them? He says, I'm doing a lot of reading for background information. That's study. The idea that the word here, the inspired authors used, is the word that means prompt exertion. So when it says to study, to show yourself approved unto God, to be approved unto God, according to the word study, means get on it, get on it, right? That's what, that's, that's what the word means there. Approved is also an interesting word here because uh, it, it is approved as in currency. I wish I had a counterfeit bill to show you. Um, our, actually, I could have done that this morning. Our printers these days are really, really good. Yeah, uh, Katie was just saying she has the, the kids have play money that looks real. Um, but anyway, this if I took this bill and and uh, uh, the the play money for Katie's kids, if I took took some of that a twenty, what would represent a twenty. If I took those to the store and I laid them out there, they're going to do that marker on it, right? They're going to say, hey, wait, buddy, this one's bogus. What are you trying to pass off here? What they're in effect saying is uh, uh, that one of the bills is approved and the other one is not approved. That's the idea of the passage or the word that's used here. A workman, it is somebody who is considered to be a hired laborer. Let that sink in for just a moment. Paul is telling his audience, us, that we have been hired. How were you hired to fulfill what's in this passage? You were hired the very day, the very moment, that you came up out of the baptismal waters being somebody entirely new. Because now, as a Christian, you have duties to perform, right? We are hired laborers. Also from this passage is rightly dividing or handling accurately. The sense of the word here is to cut a straight line. Now think about that. We were talking in class today. There are, Jesus, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, a passage that the Holy Spirit just laid on my heart because it's so relevant, right? It's Jesus said there that he was going to create his church. You know, in this conversation to Peter, right? He did not say churches plural. Jesus built one. If you, if you are not a part of that readily identifiable body that Jesus died to create, you are not in the kingdom and thus your soul is still in peril. Fix it. Find what Jesus died to create. It can be found. It is there. We need to rightly divide. We need to cut a straight line between what is acceptable to God and what is not acceptable to God and then make the choice like Joshua did in chapter 24, verse, uh, verse 15. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Now, you're either going to worship God His way or you're going to worship God your way. In reality, whose then God are you worshiping? Because it isn't the God who created the heavens and earth. There are sincere people in Scripture, sincerely believing in God and sincerely lost. 
Read Acts chapter 10. Cornelius was a good, godly man going to hell apart from the preaching that Peter gave to him. We need to rightly divide. And the Holy Spirit reminds us of that. Truth is the last word we're going to look at in this particular passage before we move on, but it says truth in any matter, but in things pertaining to God and the divine duties of man, moral and religious truth. How does the Holy Spirit remind us? Through the very word that he gave us. The Holy Spirit is also our comforter because He is a testifier. This comes from John chapter 15, verse 26. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness of me. What does it mean to testify? Um, have you ever had to go to court and you were called into the witness stand? What you are doing there is testifying, right? Miriam Webster says this. There's three thoughts from their description. To make a solemn declaration under oath for the purpose of establishing a fact as in court. Okay? Secondly, to make a statement based upon personal knowledge or belief. Thirdly, to express personal conviction. I would attest to you that the Holy Spirit has declared under oath what is right, what is true, what is correct. I would also testify that from the second description Miriam Webster provides, that what the Holy Spirit has done in his testimony, he finds very personal. And then thirdly, he expresses this to us, again, through his word. So how does the Holy Spirit testify today? It, it, it involves the affirmation of biblical truths. We, we read... All right, quoted for you, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. But there are two other passages in Scripture which are very similar to the uh, sentiments that Paul taught to the Romans in chapter 10, verse 17. The first one that we'll read is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 4, 5, and 6, where it says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world, it also is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Those three texts are basically what he said in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of truth. They heard the truth, they grew in their faith. And that's, that's the fruit that's being born here. Second Thessalonians chapter, uh, uh, first Thessalonians chapter one. I have a lot of passages up here. Let's try it again. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse 13. There we go. It says right here, And for this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received from us the word of God's message, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Again, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So that's how the Holy Spirit testifies. He is also one who convicts. What, what's the reason for convicting somebody? Now it's, it's, uh, the word, the sense of the word here is different because let me go back to that court 
uh, illustration. It's, it's different from the conviction that a judge will pr- pronounce on somebody that has been accused, gone through the trial, and found guilty. It's different from that kind of conviction. Uh, but it is similar in the way that there has been a, a an accusation made, an accusation recognized, that accusation understood to the degree that, oh man, you know, you talk about pointing a finger, but you see those three pointing back at you and you realize it's kind of like in that conversation that Nathan had with David. Tells him, tells him about, you know, the landowner that had all the sheep, but he goes to his neighbor and snags one, and this was the sheep that that person really loved and, and really took care of and treated well, and, 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 and David was angry at the guy who took the one and, and realized what Nathan was saying. David was convicted of his sin. That's what the Holy Spirit does. We've been talking about uh, in uh, our Bible class the discipline uh, within the church, you know, that is to be afforded to those who are spiritually unruly. Um, God loves us. And, And if he has to use guilt to put us back, on a right path, he, he'll, he'll do that. There's nothing wrong with that. He's our God. He's perfectly capable. He's rightly able. He's justly uh, capable of doing that. And, and if it helps us walk a, a better line, then please, Lord, chastise me. Right? So... <clears throat> He is also one that guides us from John chapter uh, 16, uh, verse 13. Uh, His his ability, we need to know that his ability is is directly correlated to his desire to comfort. All right? It says here, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and will disclose to you what is to come. This goes back to the earlier passages that we looked at from John chapter 14, verses 16 and 26. The same thing is, 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 is kind of here. But the helper, the comforter, he's, you know, this is that passage that he's, he's going to steer us. And it goes back to how he does that. It's, it's through his word. So this is our comforter. You know, um, uh, he's, he guides us, he directs us, he convicts us, uh, he helps us. Why? Because he wants us to, he wants fellowship with us. First John chapter one, verse seven. He wants that fellowship, right? But it's also important for us to understand that he can be hurt. I want us to read, uh, a passage. This is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It, it doesn't really relate specifically, but there is something taking place here that I want us to see. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, this is what it says. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. What Paul is talking about here are those saints that have died. And the audience here, there seems to have been some, uh, some tears shed, not just because they're not with them anymore, but there, there may be a question as to their eternal condition. And so what Paul says here is, We don't want you to feel grief over those who are asleep. It's interesting that Christians are looked at as not dying, but sleeping. But he contrasts it with those who have no hope. Because there are those who die, and because they didn't accept Christ while they were on earth, they are certainly 
grieve worthy. Right? Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed for men to die once, and then the judgment. If you, you're, you can't be baptized, you can't baptize yourself for somebody who's already died. Can't do that. That, this passage clearly, clearly points that out. So, the grieving aspect, Keep that in mind for just a moment, because the same grief that we have over those who have left is the kind of grief that we're going to be looking at here. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't cause the Holy Spirit to experience the same grief that you expressed when you lost somebody dear to you. That's what he feels when we behave in such a way so as to cut God away from us. Don't do that. Verse 31, it says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. And so verse 31 is basically uh, a, a clarification of those things which grieves or hurts the Holy Spirit. Right? Look at all of these things. Clamor, slander. You know what slander is? You know, it's pointing the finger at somebody and, 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 and saying something about them. Uh, so that others can hear that's totally false. That's what slander is. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a minute. Verse 32, though, notice this. It says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. That's how we're supposed to relate to those around us. Be kind, be forgiving, be merciful. God knows we need that. Amen? Amen. Um, there is a reality uh, that we're talking about here, and it is, it is blasphemy. And the, the Greek word that we get our term blasphemy, it's not a translation, but it is a transliteration because the Greek word is blasphemia. And so there's a similarity between blasphemy and blasphemia. Let me, let me contrast it this way. The word we translate from the Greek as the, the kind of love that Jesus had for us is agape. Agape and love don't sound anything alike. You, you, they're not spelled the same. A uh, few of the letters are used in one word, as, uh, you know, as in the other. Uh, so, so we translate agape into love, all right? That's a translation. But again, this one here is a translation. It's kind of uh, simply put, but you get, you get the point here. So what is it, what, what is it, how do you, how can you, how are the different ways that blaspheme, the Greek word, how can that be seen? One way is, again, to hurt, and we've, we've, we've been discussing that. But another one is to blast the reputation my son has a new uh, firearm, and um, it's, it's basically a semi-automatic shotgun. And uh, one of the ranges that we go to, they said, you cannot put buckshot in that gun and fire it at our range. Don't do that. We're allowed to use uh, slugs in that. It still sounds the same. Bang! Really loud, you know. That's that's just fun stuff, you know. So anyway, well, anyway, he and I find that fun stuff. So anyhow, uh, that's that's what's going on here. Someone has a reputation, and somebody else is blasting away at it. And we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, to, to smite with words, smite. That's when you're smiting somebody. Words can hurt. They can. 
All right. Uh, it denotes injurious speaking or slanderous defamation. You know why slander is so effective? It's because it, it looks at an individual. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 3. It looks at an individual and uh, recognizes some truths, but there's just enough of a twist that's placed upon that truth that allows others then to be able to see the slander and be affected by it. Okay? In Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 20, notice what takes place here. He came home, and the multitude gathered again to such an extent they couldn't even eat a meal. When his own people heard... Uh, heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, he's lost his senses. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebub, and he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. Do you see the truth? Do you see the mistruth? Do you see the slander? He called them to himself, began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If the kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom can't stand. The way that Jesus here fends off the slander that his own disciples heard and could be affected by that is to point out some logical facts. He's saying, why would I, who's doing everything for good, Use something evil to get rid of another evil. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. He continues, if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he can't stand, but he is finished. No one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless first binds and uh, binds a strong man, and then he'll plunder the house. Truly, I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. These people that were pointing to Jesus saying that his spirit was filthy blasphemed. And unless they repent of that, there will be no forgiveness. No forgiveness. Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. <clears throat> um, they kind of say the same thing here. It says, therefore I say to you, any... Sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. And whoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever shall speak against the Holy Spirit, it shall be, not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. Folks, I, we have to put this into some perspective here. Into I, I've had people come to me in the past, and they have said, I, I think I have committed the unforgivable sin. There are numerous passages in Scripture which talk about the fact that when Jesus died, he died for the purpose of forgiving all sin. In those texts, there is there's no uh, addendum there. In other words, uh, when... Uh, I, I came that all should have life except that the, if that's not in the passage. Have you ever said something rash that you wish you could take back? Oh my gosh. Who, who has not used their mouth in such a way that they later think, oh my, I can't believe. I cannot believe that came out of my mouth. Is that not something that you think God doesn't understand? 
Does he not know that we have been thoughtless at times in our words? It is my understanding that this is something that can be repented of. What is the sin specifically? What is the unforgivable blasphemy? Now keep in mind what blasphemy is. It is speaking falsely about a person's character. Does the Holy Spirit not heavily, heavily involve himself in our salvation? We cannot know how to be saved apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You couple that with 1 Peter chapter, or is it 2 Peter, uh, where I, I, it's, it's, I'm not recalling it right now because I'm old. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. If you couple John chapter 1, verse 1, with the fact that these people wrote by divine inspiration as they were given utterance by the Holy Spirit Himself, we cannot know how to be saved apart from what we read in Scripture. That's the only way. We can't know about God. We can't know about Christ. We can't know about creation. We can't know about David. We can't know about Joshua. We can't know about anything apart from this word. If I have ever said something negative, about the Holy Spirit and His character, that would be called blasphemy. But if I came to a point and said, specifically, God, I said some things about You, Your Spirit, Your Son, that was totally false, totally hurtful, totally hateful, Totally wrong. I ask for your forgiveness. I have no doubt, no doubt that God will be there. First John chapter 5, it'll be the last passage we read. Verse 16, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give for him life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death, and I do not say that he should make request for this. You know, so, yeah. If we see somebody, you know, uh, making that lightning bolt statement, you know, say, hey, whoa, you know, let's, let's don't ask for that. Amen? we got a great comforter. He helps us a lot. Let's encourage him in the work that he does. Amen? If there's any need that you have this morning, come while we stand and sing. For the sinful and the sad, bring it out. Bring it out. Here again.